0.04. And now with our lesson, M. Junkins. Good morning. Very excited. I have no idea why. Might just be the caffeine. I'm not sure. We've been uh, we've been doing inventory at work for the last couple of days. So if I'm moving around a lot, it's definitely the caffeine. So because I've just been like moving, moving, moving for the last couple of days, and the idea of like standing in a fixed position for you know any period of time seems kind of daunting. So if I just start like doing laps, it's perfectly normal. Um. Only for me. I think about time travel a lot. Am I the only one? Probably. I'm a nerd. It's okay. I love I love uh, time travel culture. I love uh, Back to the Future, Terminator, all that stuff. But uh, the kind of time travel I'm thinking about isn't like the let's go back and change history sort of thing because that never ends well according to every science fiction book ever written, ever. Um, but I like the idea of uh, the notion of going back and observing a point in history because it's kind of this um, like litmus test sort of thing where based on your answer, like what you would say kind of gauges like the type of person you are. Like if you wanted to go back and watch the signing of the Declaration of Independence, you're probably like an American history buff. Or if you want to go back and watch Beethoven perform live, you're a you know, classical music lover. Um, and... I actually had to write a paper in college once about this, just the idea uh, based on that very idea of like trying to gauge what kind of person you are. What point in history would you go back to? And mine is probably the dumbest answer of all. Because if I could go back to any point in time, regardless of history or figure, it's by most people's consideration, insignificant event, but I would love to go back to Hollywood in the year 1980, three years before I was born, because I would love to sit in the theater and watch the second Star Wars movie, The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> because, as, and you know, I'm, I'm a nerd, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a movie nerd, that's exactly where I would want to go, because... It was the first movie I ever saw as a kid that really kind of gauged the sense of a larger universe. And I think in a way that makes the movie more relatable to us, regardless of people and setting. It's obviously an outlandish story filled with like science fiction, spaceships, and aliens. But it's the idea of, if you, know, if you have seen the movie, if... Uh, if not, I apologize. I'm about to spoil a 35-year-old movie, so spoilers. But uh, it's it's this idea that the main character, uh, Luke Skywalker, goes through and he finds out the truth about his father and he trains to become a better warrior and he winds up getting his hand cut off and his best friend gets kidnapped. And at the end of the movie, the credits just roll. And it's this really bizarre notion for a movie uh, that early on, because up in the, like if you watch the first Star Wars movie, it's just this big hurrah. It's like, yeah, we blew up the evil Death Star, and we're getting our medals, and everything's going to be okay forever. And that's really how it differs from the second movie. And in television nowadays, you actually see this. You see this sense of continuity in universe. In a police drama, if the detective gets shot at the end of the season, then at the beginning of the season, they're in the hospital recovering from that injury. Or if there's some big secret revealed, it continues on in the next season or in the next movie. And I think that makes for better television and better movies because it and of course books have been doing this for way longer than movies and TV I don't want to knock them but just the idea that there's this bigger universe and I think in a way I emphasize with the character Luke Skywalker a lot because I have had these days where things just go wrong and wrong and wrong and at the end of the day I just want that big hurrah I just want the credits to roll on like the best moment ever and everything's gonna be okay forever but of course that's not really how life works and so the reward for going through all this trial and tribulation for the main character in Star Wars is he has to do more work he has to figure out what to do about his hand. He has to deal with his father. He has to go find his best friend. And it seems like such a rip-off. Because the character is good, and the character is pure, and he wants nothing else ex except to help his friends and be a good person. 
and you know the bad guys always seem to have this upper hand and ultimately that is the way that we feel in our own lives we feel that no matter how much good we do and i think the best example of that is last week wednesday night anybody else am i the only one 550 million dollar jackpot i'm gonna buy an island you're all invited I didn't win. I didn't get the island. I don't live in Arizona or whatever the second place was. It was not Maryland. I was very disappointed. That's not the first thing I want to read in the morning. Like, the lottery winner is not in your state. Oh, oh, great. All right, I guess I'll just go to work then. And so, you know, we we look at these opportunities and we say, I'm a good person. I, I do all these good things and these great things. Why can't I catch a break? And it's the idea... Especially, this originally spawned because I knew I was going to have inventory this week, and I knew it was going to be bad. And regardless of how hard we worked over the last couple of days, there is still more work to do, and that just seems unfair. You know, we we put in this amount of time, and of course, at the end of the day, of course I know that there are worse situations out there. Of course I know that there are people out there that are way worse off than me in financial situations, in family situations, in life situations. There are way worse situations. But you know what? That doesn't matter to me, because I'm selfish. And at the end of the day you look at your own problems and you can kind of say the same thing. Not to directly call you selfish, but we as people are so good at looking inward at our own problems that when we say, I've given my all to a situation, I could very easily say, I have given my all to work. I have worked 14-hour days. Yesterday, I could not feel my feet. I could not tell you what day of the week it was. I was blindingly tired by the time I got home. And so, in my own eyes, that's enough. I've given my all to the company. I've given everything that is required of me. But I haven't given all. Because at the end of the day, there's always a little bit more of a push we can make. There's always a little bit harder that we could work. Because you look at athletes and people who run marathons and people who perform day after day in theater and in television, and you've got to say, that's got to be a daunting schedule. You know, you're talking like 12, 14 hour days every single day in training, in preparation, in working. We're going to be getting to the main scripture here in just a moment, which will be out of Matthew chapter 26. But before that, I just want to read a really quick excerpt out of the book of Proverbs, chapter 24, verses 16, 19, and 20. Because this relates to my lesson today. It is not enough to base a whole lesson on, but I don't think I've ever read this verse before. I'm one of those people who I could have told you up and down that yes I've read the Bible I've read the Bible through and through I've read every book but it continues to surprise me so really quick just Proverbs 24 verses 16, 19 and 20 for, through, for though the righteous fall seven times they rise again but the wicked stumble when calamity strikes do not fret because evil do because of evildoers, or be envious of the wicked. For the evildoer has no future hope, and the lamp of the wicked will be snuffed out. It's this really theatrical and just wonderful verse that is going to tie into the idea of Jesus giving his all for humanity. But the idea that even though we fall, even if we fall seven times, and of course that's just a number, you know, we could fall any number of times, the capability for God to get us back on our feet, to help us keep going, is there. It is ever-present, and it is something that should inspire us to be better people. Because especially the part where it says, but the the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. That is because when something bad happens to somebody who doesn't have faith, who doesn't believe in God, who doesn't believe in Jesus, the first thing they do is they blame the God that they don't believe in. I've seen it all the time. I've seen atheists say, oh, everything's going so bad, way to go, God. It's like, oh, the God you didn't believe in a few minutes ago? You're blaming him now? 
And it, it's this idea that when calamity strikes, you've got to blame somebody and it can't possibly be yourself because I'm too important. I've done too much good. I've done everything right. Me, me, me. Most of the time that's true. I do everything right. <laughs> because there's that, there's that little voice whispering in the bottom of your soul that says that you've done everything right, champ. Good job. I'm sorry things are still bad. But we are inspired to get up and keep moving. The heart of the Scripture, Matthew 26, we're looking at verses 39 and 42. We're looking at two, count it two instances that Jesus prays in the garden. Two. Dose. That's crazy because, you know, He's Jesus. He should be like, yay, crucifixion! Nobody? No, of course not. It's a crucifixion. It's a bad thing. And it's one of those things that Jesus in all of His infinite power and wisdom and perfection still has this minute moment where He has to emphasize the humanity of the situation. Looking at 26, verse 39 first. Going a little farther, He fell with His face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from Me, yet not as I will, but as you will. How many times in a prayer have you asked for God's will? How many times? Think about it. It's so formulaic in our faith today to say that God, I really want this bad situation to be lifted from me. I want the illness cured. I want the financial problem solved. I want to find a job. But your will be done. Now, that's this kind of weird contractual arrangement that we have as people. Because you may say, God, your will be done. But what you're saying is, God, I want this, please. And you just kind of hold it there. And you're just hoping beyond hope that God's will matches up with your own. You're just really hoping. I would have loved to have gone home at... Four o'clock yesterday. I, I had to be at work at eight o'clock in the morning, which, you know, woohoo, it's an hour later than I normally go, so that was great. But I would have loved to have gone home, but no, we hit four and we realize we're not done, and we hit six and we realize we're not done, and we hit eight o'clock and we realize we're not done, and it, my boss says just everybody go home. We'll give it another shot you know, tomorrow or the next day. We'll, we'll figure this out later. <coughs> and so, at the beginning of the day, I could have said, God, I would love to be done at four, but your will be done. And when I don't get the answer that I want, when I don't get the results that I want, I become outraged. God, I asked you for this. I said your will be done, but I asked for this. And it's one of those things where what is it to give all? I mean, what what is that? What does giving all really mean? When do we give all? I would interpret that we give all when we're done. When we're done with this life, however short or long it may be, my interpretation has always been at the end of that. Regardless of situation, you don't have to sacrifice yourself for the greater good. You can lead a long, happy life. But at the end of that life, you have given your all. You are literally and physically and spiritually incapable of giving any more than you have. And Jesus, in His short life, I'm sure in a couple of years when I turn 33, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look back and be like, wow, I'm the same age Jesus was. If I was Jesus, I'd be out of time right now. That's all I got. That's all I am able to give. And to think of how short a time that is, even though when we're at work or we're in a situation and we just want time to go faster, we can look back on three decades of life and go, wow, did that sure go by quick? Because that's just how our brains work. It's how we interpret time. <coughs> Looking at Matthew 26, verse 42. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, 
If it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. I don't think I've ever meant may your will be done as much as Jesus does in this instant. I don't think I've ever meant it as much as he did there. Because he means it. I'm I'm not sure if there would ever be a situation in my life where I would have to give up everything and be able to swallow my pride and say, God, let your will be done. And we're not going to be asked to do that because Jesus was the final and the ultimate and the solidifying sacrifice for the sins of humanity. But if he is able to do this, if he's able to drink this cup, because of the very next passage, he gets up and says, let's go meet my accusers. It is this final moment of solitude, this final moment of peace, where Jesus is able to process it and understand it, and he gets up and he knows that for the rest of his life it is going to be terrible. There are people denying him. There are people physically and emotionally punishing him. There are people denying the fact that he is the Christ, that he is the Son of God. And ultimately, at the end of that, like Jeff talked about today, during communion, there will be this final moment, this final awful moment in the life of Jesus where he truly gives up everything. So when I look back on my life and I say, I've given everything, that means that I think I've given everything. I feel like I've given enough, and that should be good enough. But that's way too long of a thought, so we we minimize it into, I've given everything. I have given everything up in this situation. We look at the sacrifices we've made. We look at the situations in our lives. Because I can guarantee you, I am not the only one in the room who is not exactly where I want to be. Because if that was true, I'd be running away with $550 million and buying an island. I don't know why I'm so fixated about this island plane, but I think it'll work. But ultimately, even in the most practical of senses, I remember in college, which was six years ago. It's, I mean, that's not a lot of time, but that's, that's enough time to really make you think. Because I was asked, where do I want to be in five years? Where do I want to be in ten years? Who do I want to be when I grow up? You know, And it's one of those things that you really look back on it and you say, wow, I could have done more if I had done this instead of this, if I had done that instead of that. But... That is not what is expected of us. We are not to dwell on the past. Jesus never looked back and said, wow, if I could do it all over again. No. He looks at this moment that he sees coming a mile away. He has supper with the disciples. He talks about being betrayed. He goes off to the garden. He prays by himself. He asks God to take it away. And there is nothing miserable enough in my life to ever trump that. To be kneeling alone in a garden while your disciples are sleeping of all things. I'm sure the disciples were great guys. I'm sure they were loyal followers through and through to the end. But it's one of those things where Jesus sits down at dinner and he talks about being betrayed and he talks about being executed and he talks about being sacrificed. And his disciples are like, oh man, that's a bummer. Good night. I'm going to go take my nap now. I'm pretty bush from the... Man, I had to work an eight-hour shift. Woo. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some dinner and crash for a bit. I'm going to take a nap. And it's one of those things where Jesus is in this solitude where... He is alone and he asks God to take it away, but at the end he says, not my will, but yours be done. And ultimately, that is something that we struggle to ask every day. We struggle to be the people that God wants us to be because of the selfish ambitions in our own minds. Because we know best. We know what's best for us and the world and the economy and our children and the future of America and we are right all the time about these things. So why can't I just take control? 
Because at the end, I'm not strong enough. I'm not strong enough. Tim is not strong enough. I'm not making presumed judgments about anybody else in this room except for me. Because I know me and I know I'm not strong enough to deal with this. I know I'm not strong enough to make the sacrifice play. I know I'm not strong enough to take on the problems of the world and the sins of the world. I am insignificant in that regard, but that is fine. Because it is not asked of me. Jesus knelt alone in the garden and He said, Lord, if there's any way... And we've been in situations similar to that. Our back is to the wall. Things are going bad. Things are getting worse. And we say, Lord, there's got to be an exit. There's got to be another way. There's got to be a problem to fix this. But even if we fall seven times, we will get up again. That passage out of Proverbs. The idea that we can power through this situation, the idea with God on our side, with Jesus' sacrifice backing us as people, we can get up again. We can be inspired by that. We can be better people as a result of that. And that is the reason that I am not strong enough. Because I would die for my parents and my brothers and my friends and my extended family and don't worry, everybody in this room. I didn't want you guys to worry. Except maybe Tom, he's got a bit of an attitude. <laughs> he just kind of he just kind of shook his head like whatever. <laughs> But I am not strong enough to die for the strangers of the world, for my enemies, for the people I don't get along with, for the people I barely know. Trust me, I spent like 24 hours you know, over the last couple of days in my building with my coworkers. That is a short list. And so we have to look at the sacrifice that Jesus made and we have to be inspired by that. And if you're here today and you agree and you want to be strengthened by that, if you want to be reinforced by that, if you want to fix something in your life, because ultimately there are things in my life that are broken that need fixing. I'm not saying I'm a bad person or an evil person or a misunderstood person. I'm not saying I've done everything wrong under the sun, but I am aware enough to look within my own heart and say, Jesus, there are things I need to fix to be a better person for you. And if you're looking for that, and if you want to give yourself up to that, I ask you to contemplate these things as we stand and sing the song of invitation. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power?